Chapter Twenty Two of Twelve Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As the steamer glided on its way towards New Orleans, perhaps I was not happy. Perhaps there was no difficulty in restraining myself from dancing round the deck. Perhaps I did not feel grateful to the man who had come so many hundred miles for me. Perhaps I did not light his pipe, and wait and watch his word, and run at his slightest bidding. If I didn't, well, no matter. We tarried at New Orleans two days. During that time I pointed out the locality of Freeman's slave pen, and the room in which Ford purchased me. We happened to meet Theophilus in the street, but I did not think it worth while to renew acquaintance with him. From respectable citizens we ascertained he had become a low, miserable rowdy, a broken-down, disreputable man. We also visited the recorder, Mr. Genois, to whom Senator Soule's letter was directed, and found him a man well deserving the wide and honourable reputation that he bears. He very generously furnished us with a sort of legal pass, over his signature and seal of office, and as it contains the recorder's description of my personal appearance, it may not be amiss to insert it here. The following is a copy. State of Louisiana, City of New Orleans, Recorder's Office, Second District. To all to whom these presents shall come. This is to certify that Henry B. Northup, Esquire, of the County of Washington, New York, has produced before me due evidence of the freedom of Solomon, a mulatto man, aged about forty-two years, five feet seven inches and six lines, woolly hair and chestnut eyes, who is a native born of the state of New York, that the said Northup, being about bringing the said Solomon to his native place, through the southern routes, the civil authorities are requested to let the aforesaid coloured man Solomon pass unmolested, he demeaning well and properly. Given under my hand and the seal of the city of New Orleans, this 7th January, 1853. T. H. Genois, Recorder. On the 8th, we came to Lake Pontchartrain, by railroad, and in due time, following the usual route, reached Charleston. After going on board the steamboat, and paying our passage at this city, Mr. Northup was called upon by a custom-house officer to explain why he had not registered his servant. He replied that he had no servant, that, as the agent of New York, he was accompanying a free citizen of that state from slavery to freedom, and did not desire nor intend to make any registry whatever. I conceived from his conversation and manner, though I may perhaps be entirely mistaken, that no great pains would be taken to avoid whatever difficulty the Charleston officials might deem proper to create. At length, however, we were permitted to proceed, and passing through Richmond, where I caught a glimpse of Goodin's pen, arrived in Washington January 17th, 1853. We ascertained that both Birch and Radburn were still residing in that city. Immediately a complaint was entered with a police magistrate of Washington, against James H. Birch, for kidnapping and selling me into slavery. He was arrested upon a warrant issued by Justice Goddard, and returned before Justice Mansell, and held to bail in the sum of $3,000. When first arrested, Birch was much excited, exhibiting the utmost fear and alarm, and, before reaching the Justice's office on Louisiana Avenue, and before knowing the precise nature of the complaint, begged the police to permit him to consult Benjamin O. Shekels, a slave trader of seventeen years' standing, and his former partner. The latter became his bail. At ten o'clock, the 18th of January, both parties appeared before the magistrate. Senator Chase of Ohio, Honourable Orville Clark of Sandy Hill, and Mr. Northup acted as counsel for the prosecution, and Joseph H. Bradley for the defence. General Orville Clark was called and sworn as a witness, and testified that he had known me from childhood, and that I was a free man, as was my father before me. Mr. Northup then testified to the same, and proved the facts connected with his mission to Avoyelles. Ebenezer Radburn was then sworn for the prosecution, and testified he was forty-eight years old, that he was a resident of Washington, and had known Birch fourteen years, that in 1841 he was keeper of William's slave pen, 
that he remembered the fact of my confinement in the pen that year at this point it was admitted by the defendant's counsel that i had been placed in the pen by birch in the spring of eighteen forty one and hereupon the prosecution rested benjamin o shekels was then offered as a witness by the prisoner benjamin is a large coarse-featured man and the reader may perhaps get a somewhat correct conception of him by reading the exact language he used in answer to the first question of defendant's lawyer he was asked the place of his nativity and his reply uttered in a sort of rowdyish way was in these very words i was born in ontario county new york and weighed fourteen pounds benjamin was a prodigious baby he further testified that he kept the steamboat hotel in washington in eighteen forty one and saw me there in the spring of that year he was proceeding to state what he had heard two men say when senator chase raised a legal objection to wit that the sayings of third persons being hearsay was improper evidence the objection was overruled by the justice and shekels continued stating that two men came to his hotel and represented they had a coloured man for sale that they had an interview with birch that they stated they came from georgia but he did not remember the county that they gave a full history of the boy saying he was a bricklayer and played on the violin that birch remarked he would purchase if they could agree that they went out and brought the boy in and that i was the same person he further testified with as much unconcern as if it was the truth that i represented i was born and bred in georgia that one of the young men with me was my master that i exhibited a great deal of regret at parting with him and he believed got into tears nevertheless that i insisted my master had a right to sell me that he ought to sell me and the remarkable reason i gave was according to shekels that he my master had been gambling and on a spree he continued in these words copied from the minutes taken on the examination birch interrogated the boy in the usual manner told him if he purchased him he should send him south the boy said he had no objection that in fact he would like to go south birch paid six hundred and fifty dollars for him to my knowledge i don't know what name was given him but think it was not solomon did not know the name of either of the two men they were in my tavern two or three hours during which time the boy played on the violin the bill of sale was signed in my bar-room it was a printed blank filled up by birch before eighteen thirty eight birch was my partner our business was buying and selling slaves after that time he was a partner of theophilus freeman of new orleans birch bought here freeman sold there shekels before testifying had heard my relation of the circumstances connected with the visit to washington with brown and hamilton and therefore it was undoubtedly he spoke of two men and of my playing on the violin such was his fabrication utterly untrue and yet there was found in washington a man who endeavoured to corroborate him benjamin a thorne testified he was at shekels in eighteen forty one and saw a coloured boy playing on a fiddle shekels said he was for sale heard his master tell him he should sell him the boy acknowledged to me he was a slave i was not present when the money was paid will not swear positively this is the boy the master came near shedding tears i think the boy did i have been engaged in the business of taking slaves south off and on for twenty years when i can't do that i do something else i was then offered as a witness but objection being made the court decided my evidence inadmissible it was rejected solely on the grounds that i was a coloured man the fact of my being a free citizen of new york not being disputed shekels having testified there was a bill of sale executed birch was called upon by the prosecution to produce it inasmuch as such a paper would corroborate the testimony of thorne and shekels the prisoner's counsel saw the necessity of exhibiting it or giving some reasonable explanation for its non-production to effect the latter birch himself was offered as a witness in his own behalf it was contended by counsel for the people that such testimony should not be allowed that it was in contravention of every rule of evidence and if permitted would defeat the ends of justice his testimony however was received by the court he made oath that such a bill of sale had been drawn up and signed but he had lost it 
and did not know what had become of it. Thereupon the magistrate was requested to dispatch a police officer to Birch's residence, with directions to bring his books, containing his bills of sales for the year 1841. The request was granted, and before any measure could be taken to prevent it, the officer had obtained possession of the books, and brought them into court. The sales for the year 1841 were found, and carefully examined, but no sale of myself, by any name, was discovered. Upon this testimony, the court held the fact to be established, that Birch came innocently and honestly by me, and accordingly, he was discharged. An attempt was then made by Birch and his satellites to fasten upon me the charge that I had conspired with the two white men to defraud him, with what success appears in an extract taken from an article in the New York Times, published a day or two subsequent to the trial. The counsel for the defendant had drawn up, before the defendant was discharged, an affidavit, signed by Birch, and had a warrant out against the coloured man for a conspiracy with the two white men before referred to, to defraud Birch out of $625. The warrant was served, and the coloured man arrested and brought before Officer Goddard. Birch and his witnesses appeared in court, and H. B. Northup appeared as counsel for the coloured man, stating he was ready to proceed as counsel on the part of the defendant, and asking no delay whatever. Birch, after consulting privately a short time with Shekels, stated to the magistrate that he wished him to dismiss the complaint, as he would not proceed farther with it. Defendant's counsel stated to the magistrate that if the complaint was withdrawn, it must be without the request or consent of the defendant. Birch then asked the magistrate to let him have the complaint and the warrant, and he took them. The counsel for the defendant objected to his receiving them, and insisted they should remain as part of the records of the court, and that the court should endorse the proceedings which had been had under the process. Birch delivered them up, and the court rendered a judgment of discontinuance by the request of the prosecutor, and filed it in his office. There may be those who will affect to believe the statement of the slave trader, those in whose minds his allegations will weigh heavier than mine. I am a poor coloured man, one of a downtrodden and degraded race, whose humble voice may not be heeded by the oppressor, but knowing the truth, and with a full sense of my accountability, I do solemnly declare before men and before God that any charge or assertion that I conspired directly or indirectly with any person or persons to sell myself, that any other account of my visit to Washington, my capture and imprisonment in William's slave pen, than is contained in these pages, is utterly and absolutely false. I never played on the violin in Washington. I never was in the steamboat hotel, and never saw Thorn or Shekels, to my knowledge, in my life, until last January. The story of the trio of slave traders is a fabrication as absurd as it is base and unfounded. Were it true, I should not have turned aside on my way back to liberty for the purpose of prosecuting Birch. I should have avoided rather than sought him. I should have known that such a step would have resulted in rendering me infamous. Under the circumstances, longing as I did to behold my family, and elated with the prospect of returning home, it is an outrage upon probability to suppose I would have run the hazard, not only of exposure, but of a criminal prosecution and conviction, by voluntarily placing myself in the position I did, if the statements of Birch and his confederates contain a particle of truth. I took pains to seek him out, to confront him in a court of law, charging him with the crime of kidnapping, and the only motive that impelled me to this step was a burning sense of the wrong he had inflicted upon me, and a desire to bring him to justice. He was acquitted, in the manner and by such means as have been described. A human tribunal has permitted him to escape, but there is another and a higher tribunal, where false testimony will not prevail, and where I am willing, so far at least as these statements are concerned, to be judged at last. We left Washington on the 20th of January, and proceeding by way of Philadelphia, New York and Albany, reached Sandy Hill in the night of the 21st. My heart overflowed with happiness as I looked around upon old familiar scenes, and found myself in the midst of friends of other days. The following morning I started, in company with several acquaintances, for Glen Falls, 
the residence of Anne and our children. As I entered their comfortable cottage, Margaret was the first that met me. She did not recognise me. When I left her, she was but seven years old, a little prattling girl, playing with her toys. Now she was grown to womanhood, was married, with a bright-eyed boy standing by her side. Not forgetful of his enslaved, unfortunate grandfather, she had named the child Solomon Northup Staunton. When told who I was, she was overcome with emotion and unable to speak. Presently Elizabeth entered the room, and Anne came running from the hotel, having been informed of my arrival. They embraced me, and with tears flowing down their cheeks, hung upon my neck. But I draw a veil over a scene which can better be imagined than described. When the violence of our emotions had subsided to a sacred joy, when the household gathered round the fire that sent out its warm and crackling comfort through the room, we conversed of the thousand events that had occurred, the hopes and fears, the joys and sorrows, the trials and troubles we had each experienced during the long separation. Alonzo was absent in the western part of the state. The boy had written to his mother a short time previous, of the prospect of his obtaining sufficient money to purchase my freedom. From his earliest years that had been the chief object of his thoughts and his ambition. They knew I was in bondage. The letter written on board the brig, and Clem Ray himself, had given them that information. But where I was, until the arrival of Bass's letter, was a matter of conjecture. Elizabeth and Margaret once returned from school, so Anne informed me, weeping bitterly. On inquiring the cause of the children's sorrow, it was found that, while studying geography, their attention had been attracted to the picture of slaves working in the cotton field, and an overseer following them with his whip. It reminded them of the sufferings their father might be, and, as it happened, actually was, enduring in the South. Numerous incidents, such as these, were related, incidents showing they still held me in constant remembrance, but not, perhaps, of sufficient interest to the reader to be recounted. My narrative is at an end. I have no comments to make upon the subject of slavery. Those who read this book may form their own opinions of the peculiar institution. What it may be in other states, I do not profess to know. What it is in the region of Red River is truly and faithfully delineated in these pages. This is no fiction, no exaggeration. If I have failed in anything, it has been in presenting to the reader too prominently the bright side of the picture. I doubt not hundreds have been as unfortunate as myself, that hundreds of free citizens have been kidnapped and sold into slavery, and are at this moment wearing out their lives on plantations in Texas and Louisiana. But I forbear. Chastened and subdued in spirit by the sufferings I have borne, and thankful to that good being through whose mercy I have been restored to happiness and liberty, I hope henceforward to lead an upright, though lowly life, and rest at last in the churchyard where my father sleeps. End of chapter 22